Hi everybody. Hope you're all having a good day today so far. Today we are going to talk about the budget set correspondence and some of its properties. And the next time we will look at the continuity properties of the budget set correspondence. So uh, let's start right in. So uh, let's first draw a picture of the budget set. If we've got the commodity space and uh, let's mark off a couple of points on uh, each of the uh, axes here and let's draw in a budget constraint. And so this is the familiar budget constraint and of course the budget set for a consumer is the set of all consumption bundles and here of course we're doing all this geometrically here at least in R2 with uh, bundles that only have two goods, two dimensions. So the budget set is all the consumption bundles that satisfy the budget constraints. So we've got the budget set is the set of all X's in R, and let's say in general there could be L goods such that P dot X is less than or equal to whatever the budget amount is that consumer has available or budgeted uh, to spend on, on consumption bundle. And of course P dot X here is just some of the amounts spent on each of the goods at the market prices that the consumer faces. And uh, of course that budget set, everything on or below the budget constraint, depends on the prices. And of course, I guess, depends also on the, uh, the budget amount. So over here, let's draw a diagram of the prices. So here we have only two goods, so only two prices. And our budget uh, set correspondence then is a correspondence, and I'll use beta, B for budget set correspondence. It's a correspondence that maps price vectors or price lists into consumption bundles or maybe more generally if we want to include the uh, budget amount as a parameter we would have to include that as well. I'm going to come back to that in a moment but for right now let's just fix the amount of the, uh, the budget and Let's look, for example, at a typical uh, price list. Let's mark off some uh, points on the, on the, uh, in the price space as well. Let's say we have one, two, one, two here. And so let's, for example, look at the price list P equals two, one. And so what will the budget set look like for that price list? Well, of course, we can't say for sure what the budget set's going to look like without knowing the budget amount. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take uh, a general equilibrium perspective on the budget set and the budget set correspondence. And what I mean by that general equilibrium perspective is that we're going to say that the amount that the consumer has to spend on uh, the consumption bundle is the value of whatever the consumer's initial bundle is, whatever the initials, whatever the value of the consumer's holdings of the goods is and I've used an X with a little circle above it to represent that initial bundle or the endowment of goods for the consumer. And so let's just take for example the, uh, the a point here and I'm going to use a little kind of square here for the point to represent this initial bundle. And so here I've got X circle and let's suppose that is the bundle 9 and 6. 9 units of the first good, 6 units of the second good is what the consumer owns and can take to the marketplace and sell some or all of to achieve 
his or her uh, budget to spend on the goods. And so if that's the case, and this is the market price list that the consumer is facing, then of course we have P dot uh, X circle, M here, would be 2, that's the price of the first good, times 9 plus 1 times 6, or 24. And that means that the consumer, if she spends all of that income on the second good, it's a price of $1, let's say, per unit, could get 24 units. And if she spends it all on the first good at a price of $2 a unit, could get 12 units. So this now is the budget constraint for this price list and for this initial bundle of goods that the consumer owns, resulting in this, uh, this budget amount, if you like. And everything in here on the budget constraint and below is the budget set at this price list. So we've said that the budget set takes prices, maps them to sets over here. So this is a correspondence. So we call it the budget set correspondence. Clearly, the target space is going to be RL plus. We've even written that here. But what's the domain going to be? What are the price lists that we want to admit as potential price lists that the consumer might face? Well, do we want to include prices that are zero? Do we want to include the price of the first good being zero so that it's free? Price of the second good being zero? Well, I think it would be a good idea, as it turns out in the analysis we'll do, to include zero prices. And so uh, what about the price list where all the prices are zero? Well, that turns out in some sense to be not only kind of unrealistic, but results in a budget set that is everything in R2 plus or RL plus more generally, because if all the prices are zero, you can afford anything, whatever, whatever your your budget amount is. So we're going to say that the budget set correspondence takes parameter values, that is, the, envi the environmental variables that the consumer faces, and maps them to consumption bundles in RL+. Plus. But the question is, what is this capital theta? Well, I've just suggested that we might want to make the capital theta equal to RL plus, including zero prices, but not including the zero vector, the zero price list where all the prices are zero. So that is what we will do, but that does pose a kind of a, a an analytical problem uh, makes things a little inconvenient when we try to do a, a fair amount of the analysis because this set is unbounded, so it's not bounded, and also it's not closed because we've removed the zero vector. So that's going to pose a little bit of a problem that we'll come back to in a few moments. But for right now, let's just see how this budget set behaves and moves around as a function or correspondence uh, related to the price vector or price list that generates the budget set. So first, let's look at, let's say, a different price list. Let's take the price list P, let's call it P tilde, equals 1, 2. And so what are we going to have over here? In fact, 
Uh, let me use a different color for this just so we can see the difference. And I'll underline this one. I should have probably written it in a different color. Uh, so now we would have a different price list, P tilde. Let's say the same initial bundle. So now we have 1 times 9 plus 2 times 6 or 21, say $21 available to, uh, to spend on the goods. And that budget constraint will go from 10 and a half here because at a price of $2 per unit, if you've got $21, you could afford 10 and a half units of the second good and you could afford uh, 21 units of the first good. So this budget constraint is going to look like this. So this is beta of uh, P tilde. And of course, the budget constraint in each case is just the line in R2 perpendicular or orthogonal to the price vector in RL, a larger dimensional space, it'll be the, the uh, hyperplane orthogonal to the price vector. And so actually let's take this Let's take this arrow off of here. So we have some space to, to actually put the price vectors in here. So for the price vector P tilde, price of one for the first good and two for the second, our price vector would be kind of short here in this, this scale. This would be the price vector one, two, and here we would have the price vector two, one, our price vector P. And so let's look at one more uh, price list here and the budget set that it generates. Let's look at the price list four, two, which is just the scalar multiple two times P. So that would be out about here. That's P prime, let's say. That's 4, 2, which is just 2 times P. Well, that price vector is going to be twice the price vector P, but the budget constraint then is going to be exactly the same. And so that seems a little counterintuitive at first. We've doubled all the prices. You'd think that the uh, consumer wouldn't be able to afford as much at those higher prices. But of course, by doubling all the prices, we've also doubled the value of the initial bundle. And so that's doubled. The prices are doubled. Consumer can afford exactly the same bundles as she did to begin with. And in fact, let's even write that in here. We have P prime times uh, X circle, dot product with X circle. That's going to be uh, 4 times 9 plus 2 times 6. That's going to be 48. And so the consumer can still afford 24 units of the second good or 12 units of the first good or anything along here. And the budget set then is exactly the same as it was before. So we have, this is the budget set at P prime, and I see we didn't actually put in here the number 21 over here. So we can see that what's going on here is that as we move, as the price list moves around in the domain, the corresponding budget set is going to be rotating around the initial bundle and so that actually gives us a first general result about the budget set correspondence. Everything we've done up till now is really uh, specific to the numerical examples. And of course, this first, <laughs> this first general result is utterly simple and trivial. Uh, but that is that for every price list in the domain, 
the uh, initial bundle is going to be in the budget set for that price list. Um, as, of course, quite trivial because uh, at the bundle x circle, of course, p dot x circle is going to be less than or equal, in fact, equal to what's on the right-hand side. So the, the initial bundle is always going to be actually on the budget constraint, whatever the price list is. And of course, here we've just said that it's, it's in the budget set. And since that's a kind of general result, I've written it in a different color here, and I'm going to put a little star by it. Um, and so uh, let's come back to that uh, point that we just made uh, a few moments ago when we uh, took a scalar multiple of one of the prices. Now, the fact that the scalar multiple the scalar multiple we used was two was of course completely irrelevant. It could have been three, could have been a half. If we multiply a price list by any positive scalar multiple, the same thing is going to happen. That is, the budget set will not change. It'll be unchanged. And so that gives us another general result. And that would be that for any price list in the domain and for any scalar, any strictly positive scalar, so in R++, it's going to be the case that beta of lambda P is equal to beta of P. The budget set is going to be constant uh, along any ray coming out of the origin. And let's put a little star by that as well, because again, we have here a general result. Oh, this, uh, this property of the budget correspondence is often expressed by saying that the budget correspondence is homogeneous of degree zero, which means that we can write beta of lambda p as lambda to the zero beta of p for any price list p and any positive lambda. And it's the zero power here that uh, is what, why we say that the uh, budget correspondence is homogeneous of degree zero. If this were a one lambda, lambda times beta of p, then we would say it's homogeneous of degree one. And of course, lambda to the zero is one, so we don't usually write lambda to the zero here, but it's homogeneous of degree zero, and it is this homogeneity of degree zero exactly that enables us to circumvent this problem with the domain that we described a few moments ago, where uh, we noted that the domain is neither bounded nor closed, but that for analytical purposes, we sometimes want to have a domain for this correspondence that is compact. And so how is it that this homogeneity allows us to uh, actually t kind of squash the domain down into a compact set? Well, to say that beta of lambda p is always equal to beta of p, as we said a few moments ago, is to say geometrically that the correspondence is constant on any ray coming out of the origin. So let's draw the ray through the two points that we've already, that we've already drawn here. Let's take this off a little here so it doesn't look like it's part of, the, <laughs> part of these arrows here. And so, uh, since the budget set is the same for every price list on the ray, we can represent what's going on with these price lists by just one of the price lists on the ray. And so, what we do is we use the price list that is also on the unit simplex. So, in R2, this is the unit simplex, the line segment 
going from one on the vertical axis to one on the horizontal axis. And it is the set that we generally use uh, capital S to denote. And it's the, it's the set of all price lists in this case whose components add up to exactly one. And so uh, the same in RL and R2, it's just this little line segment here. And in larger dimensional space, it'll be a hyperplane, a segment of a hyperplane that contains all of the unit vectors on the, on the axes. Um, so that's the unit simplex. And of course, we could have written this condition as the norm of P is exactly one, where we use the taxicab norm, the Manhattan uh, city block norm, where the norm of P is the uh, sum of the absolute values of the components. And of course, since these components are all non-negative, the absolute value, we can dispense with the absolute value. So this is the all of the price lists whose norm, this norm here, is one. And so on this ray, the price list that we're talking about that will represent all the other price lists on the ray would be the price list, I'll call it P double prime, two thirds, one third. Prices add up to one and this price list is one third of this price list, or if you like, one sixth of this price list. So those would be the scalar multiples that get us down onto the unit simplex. For this price list, the corresponding price list on the unit simplex would be uh, one third, two thirds, one third of this price list. And of course, the unit simplex is compact. It's both closed and bounded. So that actually has enabled us to kind of, as I said, squash the domain down into just this compact set. And while we did this diagrammatically here for R2, same works exactly the same way in RL. And so what that does is it enables us to kind of define a new version of the budget correspondence, which is the original budget correspondence restricted to the set S, to the domain S. So that has the domain S and, of course, still maps into RL plus. And we could then recover our beta correspondence by noting that for any price list in the domain, beta of P will be this correspondence here at P times the scalar one over the norm of P. That is, the denominator is the sum of the prices. So this vector will be in the unit simplex. So that enables us to, to as I say, kind of compress or squash the, the domain down to a compact set. This is not something we're going to use today or even in our next lecture, but we'll use it later on. And you will definitely use this in your microeconomics course when you're talking about, uh, for example, general equilibrium. Now, what else can we say about the budget correspondence before we end today and then next time we'll go on to talk about the continuity properties of the correspondence. We can say, well, let's first note, let's put our initial bundle here again. Let's see what the budget correspondence or what the budget set looks like when we have one or more of the prices zero. So let's suppose that the price of the first good is zero then this will be the budget set at the price list 0, 1, 
be everything down here in this strip going on infinitely far. That will be the budget set at 0, 1 or any other price list in which the first component's 0. The budget set at the price list 1, 0 is going to be this strip here going vertically. And uh, similarly, in uh, larger dimensional space, uh, we'll kind of have the same thing. We might have only one price zero so that the budget set would be a set bounded by a constraint like this, but going on infinitely far in the positive direction. Um, and then what happens as the prices change in the domain? Well, the budget set rotates as we've said earlier, around this initial bundle here, here, and so on, and it rotates in this direction as, as the ratio of the first price to the second price uh, gets larger as we move down along here in the simplex, for example. The budget set will rotate like this, and so, so long as all the prices are positive, we're going to have something like this that's compact, but we clearly aren't going to have a compact um, image set when any of the prices are zero. And that poses a little bit of a problem as well, just like the non-compact domain over here. And finally, let's just note as well that the budget set is always going to be a convex set, that's clear. So we have that the budget correspondence is convex valued. And also, it's easy to see that the budget set will always be a closed set. So the budget correspondence is closed valued. And there are a number of other properties that we can develop, but they're all related to the continuity of the budget correspondence. And so I'm going to defer that to our next lecture, the next video, where we will look just at continuity properties of the budget correspondence. So that's what we'll do next time, and uh, see you all next time.